Hey everyone, in this video we'll dive into the simulation of 1 million particles and we will explore the magic of parametric surfaces. And finally, I wrap up with an exciting simulation of space-time curvature. Although the exact implementation of the curvature deserves its own video, so I've strived for an approximate solution. You must have remembered in this Manim tutorial series, we drew various curves based on their differential equations. Curves like Lorentz attractor illustrate how chaotic systems evolve over time. However, this curve is a trajectory of just a single particle, which demonstrates how Lorentz attractor evolves as time progresses. I guess by comparing the evolution of two particles, can we observe the chaotic effect in Lorentz attractor? But what do we need to observe the effect on a large scale, say a million particles? But simulating a million particles comes with a lot of computation power and not to mention the seemingly endless hours required to render such a simulation. This brings us a critical challenge. How can we optimize our code in order to minimize the execution time without sacrificing the accuracy of the simulation? Fortunately, to tackle such situations, to render such large-scale simulations, ManimGL provides .cloud class. And on a computation side, we have the vectorization power of NumPy to speed up the operations. To use .cloud, all we need is a set of points arranged in the 3D space. And simply, we pass those points coordinates to the .cloud. And that's it, we are done. No matter how many particles we are working with, Dot cloud instantly projects the coordinates onto the Manim canvas. And beyond that, we can easily customize the appearance of particles by adjusting their colors, radius, or opacity. And even we can set a gradient of colors. If somehow, for some specific situation, if you want a glow effect, just as we saw in shaders, we can easily achieve that with the help of glow factor parameter. Now, for the computation part of the problem, you must have remembered the evolution matrix of the Lorentz attractor. In the same way, let's start by making a n by 3 matrix, which consists of 3D coordinates of n particles. For now, I'm setting the value of n to be 1 million. And these particles will be arranged in a cube with a side length of 0.1 units. There are 100 particles along each axis, and every particle is separated by a distance of 0.001. I guess this level of precision should be sufficient for simulating the chaotic behavior of Lorentz attractor. Now, these particles need to update their position at every frame. The update Lorentz function ensures that every particle's positions update as according to the differential equations of Lorentz attractor. The x variable in this code extracts the x coordinate of every particle. Then x0 implies that we are taking the zeroth component of every row. The same logic applies to the y and the z variables. Finally, we are returning the matrix once it gets updated. Here dt is our old friend, 1 divided by frame rate. And to apply this function continuously at every frame to these dots, we can use the add updater method. And after adjusting the frame size and the orientation, we are done. See, this is how it turns out. Well, you can experiment with the number of particles and the glow factor or even the radius and see what works best for your visualization. And to simulate a different model, I just need to change the differential equations here. I tried the eyes of our tractor and this is how it turned out.
Moving on, you must have remembered the parametric curve and how we leverage the features of parametric curve to draw some amazing curves. Let's create 3D surfaces using parametric surface class. Parametric surface mostly deals with the 3D environment. There is a slight difference between the workings of parametric curve and the parametric surface. You see, unlike parametric curve which requires only one parameter to generate a graph, in parametric surface we need two parameters, u and v, to generate any surface in the 3D space. In parametric curve, we set up the step size with a t-range parameter, while in parametric surface, we control it with the resolution parameter. The higher the resolution results in the smooth surfaces. Now, let's see how can we code this parametric surface. I'm gonna start simple. A square sheet, perhaps. The code to create this square sheet is not as difficult as I initially thought. So, the working of parametric surface goes like this. We have the function with two parameters u and v and it returns an array of three elements x, y and z as according to the relation we describe here. Currently, I am assigning the x and y coordinates as equal to u and v where both u and v range from minus 2 to 2 and that's how we get the square sheet of side length 4 units and the z coordinate, it remains 0 across the entire surface. Suppose I change the x-coordinate to behave like 2u. Then I would find that the surface transformed into a rectangle of length 8 units and width of 4 units. With the z-coordinate set to 0 everywhere, I wouldn't see any noticeable 3D effect even if I reorient my camera. So let's make things more interesting by assigning a non-zero value to the z-coordinate. Perhaps a sine curve. By applying the sine u functionality to the z-coordinate, a wavy groove emerges, describing how the z-coordinate varies with the u-parameter. In the same way, cos v has a different effect on the surface. See how simple it is to create 3D surfaces? Moving on with the same logic, we can use both the parameters to modify the z-coordinate. For instance, I can create a paraboloid by simply defining the z-coordinate to be u square plus v square. But that doesn't look so appealing, right? Let's spice things up by adding some color. We can always use the set color method or even set color by gradient method to colorize a surface. Well, apart from that, Manem also provides a way to colorize the surface using RGB values using the set color by RGB method. This RGBA function takes a point as input and returns an array of RGBA values. Just like we passed every point in the Lorentz simulation, in the same way, MenMGL feeds every point of the surface to the RGBA function. Now, all we need is a function to customize the colors based on the points of the surface. Suppose I want to create a heat map effect which changes color from red to blue as I move up the surface. Basically, I want to colorize the valley with a dark red color and the peaks of this surface with a bright blue color. Clearly, the valley signifies a lower Z value, which means for these Z values, I need to increase the red component in the RGBA color. Conversely, for the peaks of the surface, I need a higher blue component. We'll implement this heat map logic into the code. And notice that by adjusting the RGB component in the array, we can set different types of color gradient for this paraboloid. Additionally, we can use this same technique, this same approach to create more complex patterns like a wavy sheet. Now, taking this approach one step further, we can even bring the dynamism in this pattern by changing the Z coordinate with respect to the time, something like this. We can achieve this dynamism by redrawing this wave continuously at every frame. Well, for these type of functionalities, Manem also provides shorthand methods like always redraw, always rotate, and always shift. You see, line 15 calls the get wave surface function at every frame, which redraws the wave sheet continuously. And line 3 depicts how the wave sheet is changing with respect to the scene time. Moreover, ManimGL has some built in common types of surfaces.
Let's take it up a notch and apply some realistic effects to the surface. One way to achieve this is by using Texture Surface class. The Texture Surface class requires an UV map surface and texture image files as its parameters. For instance, if I want to create a spherical earth, I can use the Menem's Sphere class and apply an earth texture as an image file. See, the image texture wraps perfectly around the surface of the sphere. And currently, the frame's error angles, theta and phi, are set to 0 and 90 degrees respectively. And for our convenience, I'll display the frame's error angles on the upper right corner of the screen. Now, what I noticed is if I zoom out the scene, I can see the light source situated at minus 10, 10, 10. So, as we can see, the whole scene in Manem is divided into two phases one where the light hits the surface, and another where it doesn't. Imagine just like how the sun's rays illuminate only one side of the earth. So depending on the direction and position where the light rays hit the surface, we can achieve realistic effects like reflection or gloss. These effects are influenced by the surface material properties. In ManimGL, we can adjust these parameters by using SAT shading method. So to visualize the day and night feature in Manem, we can provide another texture image file to render on the dark side of the surface. See? Simple. Alright, we know that the Earth rotation axis above which the Earth rotates is tilted by 23 and a half degrees. So this white line here shows the current Earth's axis. And using the rotate method, we can rotate this white line and the Earth as well about this yellow line. Now, after rotating the Earth's axis, I need to set the rotation of the Earth about this tilted line. Again, I can use the rotate function for that. Now, let's add the star of the solar system. Again, I'll provide two arguments, the UV sphere surface and the sun's texture file. And with that, the sun appears in the scene. Hmm, but there is something missing, don't you think? I guess I need to make the sun glow. And to achieve that, I can use the true dot, a subclass of dot cloud, and give it a yellow color with the glow factor to be 1.5. And you see, we need to ensure that this dot, this glow dot, should follow the sun at all times. And of course, we wouldn't want to forget the moon, would we? And following all the process the same way, we can achieve the sun, earth and moon system. And now comes the exciting part. Simulating the revolution of earth around the sun and the moon around the earth. To achieve this, I'll use the update function and specify the planet's position with respect to the time. So, let's define a common function for both the moon and the earth. This function will take parameters like the center about which the planet rotates, the radius of the orbit which I am assuming to be circular and not ellipse. And finally, the angular velocity. So to define the position coordinates, I can transform the radial coordinate system to the Cartesian coordinate system. And the xy components would be cos of omega t and sine of omega t. You see, the moon starts revolving around the earth. Now, finally, to visualize the curvature of space-time, I'll need a plane or a grid which resembles to a space. To show the grid, I am using the square sheet that we made earlier in the video and setting the clause and reflectiveness to 0.1. The role of z-index here is to bring the grid at the back of the scene. Every m object has this z-index parameter. The role of this z-index in every m object is that the manim renders these objects these m objects in the increasing order of the z indices. Instead of diving into the actual mathematics of general relativity, I'll use an approximate solution. I guess this Gaussian function would be perfect for this. Unless there is a better one. And please let me know if there is any function better fit for this kind of approximation. Now, we know that the curvature of space-time depends heavily on the mass and the radius of the planet. 
the denser the planet is, the deeper is the curvature. See, this 1D question function works very well to visualize how should the curvature of the spacetime looks like. As I adjust these parameters, the curvature responds accordingly. The only difference is that we'll implement this function in 2D, which means the Y coordinate also comes into the play. And to update this grid, we'll use the same technique we applied in the Lorentz attractor and we applied in the dynamic wave sheet. And by experimenting with different values of mass and radius. And if I follow the Earth, I can see an additional little tip due to the Earth's mass. That's how we can make an approximate spacetime curvature. It's not realistic, I know, but I hope you enjoyed it. Well, that's all for this video. And if you enjoyed this, do not forget to like, share and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next video.